thank you very much for as always taking the time spreading your knowledge it's been fantastic i gotta tell you a couple of uh quick news feed items that i haven't discussed with yet so on our corman's youtube channel we just hit 1000 subscribers which is very very cool so people are hitting the subscribe button they're watching us on Absolutely. all over social media they're still back in TikTok and watching close to 600,000 views on your clip on talking about why you decided to leave coaching and spending time with your son. And it's amazing where they're finding us, but they are. Also, as the chosen lawyer, I just launched a theme song with a music video. It came out at the time of taping. Steve is in it flexing. So uh, <laughs> it's amazing how we all kind of come together and have fun with it. So Steve, you know, thank you for that part of the journey as we're spreading baseball and life folklore to everybody and having them think of baseball and also think of their lives in general. And this is again, why it's called the chosen journey and talking about where people's own life journeys take them. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as we go back and talk about some of the stuff and why I stepped away, like it has been a, a tremendous summer for me. You know, I, I started coaching my son's team I uh, get to spend uh, a ton of time with him on a daily basis, teach him and his friends uh, the game of baseball and uh, really get to grow that fatherly bond with your son and, and, you know, obviously other siblings, if other families have them uh, who are, who are able to do that, you know, first scrimmage, uh, first pitch he saw, he got to hit a home run and I got to, you know, enjoy that and watch him jog around the bases and see the smile on his face and, that's like, you know, as a, as a father uh, or as a parent, when your son does something and he's put in all the hard work, it just lights you up and it puts a smile on your face and you just sit there and you say, you know what, uh, whether it's your son or somebody else's son, like it, this is when they put in the hard work and, and they deserve everything that they get. So, uh, you know, as hard as a decision as it was to step away uh, from the game that I love dearly. Um, and still love dearly and watch it on uh, a daily basis uh, in, in the house and whatnot. Uh, it's been a huge fulfillment for me uh, to spend more time with my family, to spend more time with my son uh, and to coach his baseball team. That's one of the things I've told you. Baseball is great that way because baseball's here when you need it and you never know where it's going to go. You know, we could sit here and predict where, you know, base Steve's baseball life will be in five, 10 years. And God will just laugh because you never know. It can change in a moment or who knows, you know? So from that end, Steve, you know, everybody wishes you really well as far as spending time with your son, making the choice you did and wherever the roads lead for you. And the journey is still being written. Always, always being written on a daily basis. It seems like you, you find a curve here or there and you're able to make that right hand turn and take a different road. Uh, but overall, like I said, uh, it's been it's been a tremendous summer for me. Um, I'm super happy uh, where I'm at in life right now. And uh, we'll just continue on the journey and uh, hopefully hear from other people and, and see how they're doing and, and what their journey's like. So now, as we're summing up today and talking about Steve's journey, we have not discussed one team. You know, in all these chapters so far, we've either dwelled very deep into it or touched upon the fact of the different teams that you played for, but do you know, which team we have not discussed yet, Steve. Off the top of my head, I am going to say the Texas Rangers. He's one for three, which by <laughs> the way, <laughs> in baseball, if you're one for three, you are a hall of famer. So you can fail two out of three times and you still redeem yourself with a big hit. That's right. Steve Carsey. Texas Ranger. And here's the funny part. When you go down the Baseball Almanac website, Steve, I don't know if you've ever taken a look at their site or not. So we see here, Stefan Andrew Carse. Is that correct? That is correct. Nickname, Steve. He's an Aries. Died on, still living. Living cemetery, not applicable. They actually make these categories for people. <laughs> like, God. <laughs> <laughs> there's like 10 categories I'm glad I don't want I'm glad I don't go on it there's like 10 categories and those were the, the like that's category two and three by the way it says uh -huh. your name where you were born still living cemetery is not applicable guys I think we gotta update this website so Ooh. that being said Mr. Steve Stefan call him Steve was a Texas Ranger back in the year 2005 the summer of 2005. 
Was it a cold winter or a cold summer or a warm summer back in Texas those days, Steve? It was a very hot summer. And I spent quite a few of those in double A in Frisco uh, on some bus rides. 2005 was not my greatest year. Uh, obviously, I was still coming back from a shoulder surgery that I had in 2003. And it took me a lot longer than I wanted to to come back with the procedure that I had. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of perseverance through 2004 and 2005, uh, making my way back and rehabbing and doing the things that I needed to do uh, to get back to the big leagues. And, uh, you know, it was a, towards the tail end of my career. Obviously, in 2006, I, I retired uh, or stepped away, um, you know, from my own choosing again, um, because I couldn't uh, compete at the level I wanted to. And it was taking me a lot longer to prepare for games than it was for me to pitch in games. But, uh, you know, 2005 was uh, trying, but very knowledgeable and, and, and got to meet some players and play with some players that uh, I really enjoyed you know, playing with and, and really enjoyed watching. Well, specifically, there was one magical night in 2005 for Mr. Steve Carsey. It was July 28th, 2005. What were you up to on July 28th, Steve? I believe what you're talking about, I was in uh, Whataburger Field in South Texas, and it was a combined perfect game for the AA uh, Rough Riders at the time. You see what he just did there, folks? He went from 0 for 2 for 2 to 4. He's now 2 for 4. He's hitting 500. Like, these numbers are astronomical. With Mr. Scott Feldman and A.J. Murray, correct. And against the Corpus Christi Hooks. It was the first combined nine-inning perfect game in Texas League history and the third overall. So, Steve could not leave baseball without leaving some sort of mark there. Uh, Steve, fond memories of that game? Yeah, fond memories. Super hot. Uh, we were watching what was going on there. Feldman threw the first six. Uh, I came in for the seventh and the eighth, and then Murray closed it out in the ninth uh, and got six outs. And, you know, didn't really what, know what was going on at the time, to be honest with you. I was warming up. I was rehabbing my shoulder. I was trying to feel good about going in that game. I knew what was going on, per se, but tried not to focus on it. And, uh, you know, I was able to throw enough strikes and get six outs and pass the baton on to, uh, to Murray. Did uh, everybody leave you alone as you uh, sat in between innings? Did the, the play out like that? Did Feldman come up to you as he handed you the ball and said, don't mess this up for me, Steve? Was it like that at all? No, it was not like that at all. It's just like a normal yeah. double A. is just like normal anything else. It's baseball, right? You go there, you play the game. Everybody knows a perfect game's going on. Everybody knows a no hitter's going on or what it might be. And, uh, you know, you go try to do your business and, and try to get the outs and, you know, see how it plays out. But uh, it was like a, a normal game and not, not many of the players were, you know, talking to me. Pretty cool though, as far as the overall season goes and, you know, spending a season with the Rangers plus their farm system. And I was taking a look at that roster. Like we looked at the Yankees uh, roster uh, from a few chapters back. Not as impressive, but man, it was still pretty stacked. Like they had a few guys over there uh, with that Texas team. Any uh, particular memories for you from that uh, 2005 season with the Rangers? Uh, besides that I stunk, not very many. I wasn't very good with the Texas Rangers in that game. Um, my shoulder started hurting again towards the end of the year. Uh, and, you know, I talked with Buck Showalter. He used me in... Uh, non leverage situations for the most part. And uh, I just played out the year till the end of the year and was trying to use the off season to rehab my shoulder more and, and be able to have an opportunity in 2006 to, to make a big league team. When, when you had left the Yankees, was that when Soriano got called up at the time? Actually, when I got released from the Yankees in 2005, the player that they called up when they released me was Robinson Cano. It was Cano. I keep mixing up Soriano and Cano, both great players. Well, you got, you got to see both of them, but uh, I was looking over at the roster and trying to put the connection together. But Mr. Soriano was there in Texas when you arrived. And just some names from the past, you know, look at this catching. Sandy Elmar Jr., Rod Barajas, and Gerald Laird. This infield, Adrian Gonzalez, Phil Nevin, Alfonso Soriano, Mark Teixeira, Michael Young, 
Hank Blaylock. Like, murderers, what row? Like, how did this team not score, like, 10,000 runs? Wow. Yeah, they always had good offenses, right? No matter who they had. I mean, that year and then years in the past where they had Yvonne Rodriguez and Juan Gonzalez and, and players like that, Rusty Greer, uh, you know, they always, they've always they always had tremendous lineups. So their pitching just took a beat in there because it's so hot. And when they were playing outside, it's just it's really hard to go through 30 starts as a starter and be a reliever and be able to come in in that heat on a consistent basis. So, uh, you know, now that they're inside, you know, they just need to, you know, revamp and, and get their pitching in order. And they still have a pretty good offense. And, and that's how they run things. I got to tell you, as a guy who played a lot of tennis back in the day and my youth and on real really hot summer days, like I could barely grip a tennis ball. They give the heat in Texas. Like, how do you even grip a ball at this point? Like your hands are just like oozing sweat. Like does the ball literally like pour out of your hands at that point? Well, you just got to figure a way out, right? You got the rosin at the back of the mound. You have your, 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 you know, pants and Jersey that you can kind of wipe it off in, in between pitches. But, uh, you know, you, you figure out a way it, it's not easy sometimes, but, uh, at night it's a little bit cooler and you don't sweat nearly as much, but day games can be a challenge. And look at that pitching staff they had there as well. Francisco Cordero, who ended up becoming Mike, Mike Napoli for them. Thank you, Blue Jays, for doing that. R.A. Dickey, who ended up uh, having himself a career. Scott Feldman, Cameron Lowe, Chan Ho Park. Oh, he hung around for a while there with that contract. Kenny Rogers, not the singer, but uh, also a fun pitcher to watch. Edison Volquez, C.J. Wilson. They had a lot of personalities on this team. I can only imagine in that locker room. Very and, eclectic. And the guy who ended up becoming their GM, Chris Young. So uh, hanging out with that pitching staff, uh, what were they like? Any uh, particular stories or things that stick out to you thinking back? You know, thinking back, it was just young guys trying to establish themselves. There was a couple of veteran presences there. Um, and, you know, we just kind of went about our business. Uh, you know, you try to come to the ballpark every day, prepare to win a ball game. Uh, you know, have fun with the guys, travel and, uh, you know, get to know them as best as you can. I mean, you're all teammates and you're all going out there for one purpose and that's to, to play hard and to try to win a ball game. So uh, at the end of the day, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't very much uh, separation within within the clubhouse for the time that I was there. I was only there for a short time. And, uh, you know, we did have we did have Cameron Lowe, as you said, right? Mm hmm. So the, what sticks out is my locker was next to him and he would always come in with this sack over his shoulder and put it in the empty locker between us. And I'm thinking to myself, like, is there a bag of money in this sack? Like what is in this sack that he brings to the ballpark? So I'm like, turn to him like one day and I'm like, Cam, I'm like, Hey man, I'm like, I see this sack in between there. And he says, why don't you check it out? And I'm like, because I'm not that courageous, but I would like to know what's in the sack. I don't really like to go into other people's, you know, personal belongings. And he goes into the sack and he pulls out this eight foot snake. And he used to bring the snake into the clubhouse because he didn't want to leave it at home <laughs> in his in cage or in his tank there. So he'd bring the snake in, in the sack so he could sleep and put it in the locker. And then on occasion, he would put it in one of the uh, baskets and he would drop a couple mice in there. And then we would watch the snake feed on the mice after BP. So the Mets have Timmy Trumpet, you know, the, the cards have Pujols and the 700 home runs and the 05 uh, Rangers had the snake. What was the snake's name? Do you recall? I do not recall what the snake's name was. Was Cameron Lowe a big wrestling fan? Like, was he a big fan of Jake the Snake? And Jake the Snake used to come to the ring with his sack with Damien, was his name. And, like, did he take this literally? Like, did he actually walk around with a green sack? Do you recall the he car walked, the sack? He, he walked in the clubhouse with the sack and put it in the locker. It wasn't like he walked around with the sack in the clubhouse. It just stayed in the locker till after the game. And then he would pick up his sack and walk out with it after dinner and take it home. And Do you recall what color the sack, the sack was? No, I didn't want to go near that thing after I knew there was a snake in it. Uh, did the other guys know about this? Of course they did. After the, after the fact, I mean, he was with their organization for a while. So, 
you know, most guys knew that he had a pet snake. You know what? Uh, it wasn't a memorable season. They were 79 and 83 that year. Uh, Chris Young did end up becoming the GM, but it was worth discussing them simply to find out that Cameron Lowe was uh, trying to copy Jake the Snake Roberts and was bringing a snake into the locker room. <laughs> Uh, strangest thing you, in all the years you played in baseball, minor leagues, majors, uh, off season, winter ball. Is that the strangest thing you've ever seen a dude bring to a locker room? Off the top of my head. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure if I really think back, maybe there was something else, but, uh, yeah, a, a snake tops the list. Cameron Lowe, we'll be seeing you on social media, buddy, because your clip is going to be running wild. Oh yeah. Steve. <laughs> Always a pleasure, my friend. This this time just flies by in a moment. Every time we go through the chapters and talk about the journey, and we never know quite where it's going to go. And uh, right now, with the heat of the season going on, I love mixing in what's going on currently in baseball, hearing about your career, your thoughts, and general life stories. Uh, I'm sure the queen, wherever she was, she loved listening in, rem remembering her one and a half innings watching Major League Baseball. And uh, if King Charles is watching this as well. He's welcome to come join us anytime and talk about his story. Maybe he's watching a major league baseball game as well. Yeah. We'd love to have King Charles on. Wouldn't we? I, I don't know. You probably have closer connections to him than I do. So if you have any feelers at Buckingham palace, by all means, reach out to them. And uh, if not, we may have to settle for Prince Harry or Meghan Markle. We'll see, but apparently they're going to be getting some titles as well. So stay tuned for that one. Yeah. Let's look for it. Absolutely. Steve, my friend, always a pleasure. We're looking forward to as our season continues and our journeys continue. We'll be back in a few weeks and we're going to be by then we're going to be looking at the end of the season and going to the playoffs and continuing the chosen journey. Absolutely. Thanks for having me as always. It's it's always a pleasure to talk to you and, uh, you know, discuss where both of our journeys are going and uh, how we can help other people along on their journey. And that's where I tell the fans, please write in your questions for Steve. Uh, if you want to hear about his career, his thoughts on general current events, your life journeys, you know, sharing your stories, whatever being, we'd love to hear from you. And you never know when your comment will make it to the air. So let's keep the journeys going for everybody. And we'll see you back soon. All right. See you. Have a good one. You too. Thank you.